This episode contains mature language and situations. Listener discretion is advised. You wake, standing on the doorstep of a beautiful mansion. The front door stands open. You can hear voices, music, so many, many people. You step towards the door. You have to know what's inside. You are lost. You have no memory of how you got here. It doesn't matter. Because now, you belong to... The Grey Rooms. Season 3, Episode 20, The Trials of Admiral Beckett, Part 1. An air-conditioned breeze rushed past me as the automatic doors swung wide. I left the stagnant night air behind me as I entered the grimy truck stop just outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. The power of the gray room still sizzled around me as I breathed in the dry bleach and dirt scent of the market. It was all so familiar, but the last time I'd seen this place... It hadn't been with my own eyes. Racks of convenience food ran the length of the room, and the coolers along the walls hummed with quiet life. The cocky little shit behind the counter barely glanced at me before looking back at his communication device. I probably didn't look very imposing at the moment. Beside me, the shade, my son, Samuel, took in the room with barely concealed disdain. So much excess. And yet somehow this place is disgusting. And this is one of the richest countries on the planet. I've been to this world a few times now. This chapter in the history is a particularly dark one. Uh, what? Were you talking to me? No. I was talking to my son. He warily glanced behind me. Seeing no one visible, he likely chalked my actions up to psychological issues. A common problem among the general populace in this era. (sighs) Yeah, sure, mister, whatever you say. You filling up? No, I just need some coffee. Is it fresh? I don't know. It's warm and it's brown. Help yourself. Without another word, he bent his head back to his device. I turned and strode down the far aisle. Open all night, the gas station offered several varieties of coffee and flavoring agents. I busied myself with the comfortable ritual of pouring cream and sugar. Do you know what you're going to say to him? No, not exactly. But I know how he thinks. I've seen what's in his mind. It should be easy enough to convince him that I'm no threat. And if he attacks you? 
Well, there are always other loci, I suppose. I took a sip of the coffee I'd poured for myself and nearly gagged. It was one of the most vile concoctions I've ever tasted. Coffee in hell tastes better than this. Incredible. <laughs> Dad, is this... How sure are you? What if the founder goes back on his word? Nothing for it now. We've made our choices and we'll have to live with them. Or die with them, I suppose. We are the choices we make? Yeah, yes. There'd been an uncomfortable feeling in the air between us since my memory had been fully restored. I could tell it had affected him. We should talk about what we saw in those memories. I hope you know. That was me. But it wasn't me. I know. The fluorescent lights of the mini-mart washed out his translucent face. It was hard to make out his expression. That wasn't me either. I would never... I'd never turn on you like that, Dad. I don't know if that's because I'm how Alma made me in the illusion, or something else. He stepped forward, squaring his shoulders and looking me in the eye. But I won't let you down, like he did. I'm here for you, whatever happens. Come what may. Samuel, I... I guess that's my cue. I tossed the disgusting coffee to the ground, spattering it across the yellow tile floor of the aisle. I stepped out to look across the store at the attendant. Hey, kid. Yeah, what? Sorry about this. Valkath Art Cardi. The power that coursed from my outstretched hand hauled him off his feet and slammed him hard against the wall of the gas station. He barely had time to make a noise before I gestured again and snapped his neck. I raised my hand, and his body lifted into the air to hover above the service counter. The man I was there to see stepped through the door to the market, eyes wide. It was bizarre to see him from the outside. The killer in the Oldsmobile. The servant of Astaroth. Good evening, John. You and I need to have a little talk. My chair, this time, was padded. A small plate of food sat forgotten at my side. I was not bound or bleeding, but I felt just as much a prisoner here in the mansion's grand ballroom as I had in the stables. The cool glass of liquor in my hand was what I chose to focus on in that moment. A balm from the pain that still jabbed and tugged at my muscles as I shifted trying to get comfortable. By far, the greatest ache was from the absence of my left eye. The bleeding had long since stopped, and I'd been allowed to wrap a bandage over the socket. I tried not to think about it, tried to look past the disorientation of my monocular vision. I wasn't having much luck. My chair anchored the southern end of a large circle at the ballroom center. Around the ring were the principal staff members of the Grey Room's project, everyone looking much more hale and hearty than I. Alma, Todd, and the architect were to my right. The warden sat directly across from me, licking his lips occasionally when he glanced in my direction. There was a seat for the Admiral, who had not been summoned yet, and for the architect's steward. That meant... There was one final seat in our circle of seven, open and unaccounted for. 
I knew who was going to be sitting there. You have not heard from him? At all? No, ma'am. I saw Stephen this morning in the office, but I haven't spoken with him since. I was very specific in my instructions. Perhaps I've been too lenient with him of late. I'll have to remind him what failure looks like in my domain. The warden had placed me in the room first. Alma and the architect had barely acknowledged me on their arrival. Todd had been giving me forlorn, miserable glances. He clutched a drink of his own, nursing it in an excuse not to stare. Well, we've waited long enough. Warden. Hmm. Go and fetch the Admiral. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> The Baroness walked to a side table and picked up an elegant-looking telephone. Speaking quietly into the handset, Todd, apparently unable to contain himself any longer, stood and walked to sit in the chair she'd vacated just at my side. Hi, there, Bob. How are you old now? I raised my head to regard him. He visibly flinched. Is that a serious question? Yes, of course it is. I don't like this at all. I've been worried sick about you. Most days I found Todd's simple enthusiasms charming. Not today. Don't worry about me, Todd. Worry about yourself. Whatever happens, there will be plenty of blame to go around. But you've been with the project since the beginning. You've... You've always... I know you don't like to admit it, but you, you've always tried to treat the guests right, like, with a little dignity. How can I turn that against you like this? I had no idea what to say to that. Was that what he really thought? That I cared about the dignity of mortals? I stared with my one good eye at the intricate tile pattern on the floor. What did I care about? May I present to you, Admiral Beckett. The Admiral was once again dressed in the uniform that accompanied him to the manor. It was cleaned and pressed, and despite knowing in grim detail how he'd acquired this mantle, he cut an imposing figure as he strode across the room. I stopped when I caught sight of him. I winced and I felt pity and sympathy warring across my face. Bob looked terrible. It wasn't just the bandage that covered his empty socket, or the scars that crisscrossed his hands. I'd learned enough in my readings to know all of that would heal given enough time. It was the look on his face. That tall, imperious demon who'd met me in that Ash Manor hallway was a shell of his former self. A lanky husk perched atop his chair. I turned back to the floor. The weight of all this mortal pity was an unwelcome anchor around my neck. Ah, Admiral. Welcome. So good to see you again. Architect. What? What's going on? I have some exciting news for you. Please, take a seat. You too, Todd. Under the architect's glare, Todd quickly moved across the room to another chair. He shot me a wary smile as he did, leaving me to take one of the last few remaining seats. We are gathered here today to celebrate the end of an era. We will soon be turning the page on Ash Manor. On to bigger and better things for the Grey Rooms. I stared across the distance between us, at a loss for words. I'm... done. I never have to enter a room again. What does that mean for me? An excellent question. You should know, Admiral, this is a most unusual circumstance. But then... You are a most unusual guest. Everyone, 
The Admiral and I finally had a chance to speak face to face recently. And he put to me a most compelling idea. The idea that it was time for new blood among our ranks. That a mortal perspective would be invaluable to the project's continued success. In short, he asked for a job. My head snapped up, my mouth open in surprise. I couldn't stop the words before they slipped out. You cannot be serious. The look she gave me was cold and cruel, but I was long past caring. The Admiral has proven himself ruthless and capable, to be sure, but a mortal as a part of management. Hear that, Bob. What's so wrong with that? Ain't I important to the project? You are. Of course you are. But the forces at play within the rooms, the decisions that must be made, they're beyond any mortal's limited imagination. Even an exceptional man like Mr. Beckett. Madame, we cannot rely on a mortal's flawed vision to help guide us. Whoa, old boy. Flawed vision? If anyone here has trouble seeing, it looks like it's you. It had been so long since I'd seen him in person, I hardly recognized him. Almost involuntarily, I staggered to my feet. The others followed my example. Strolling into the room as if he owned the place, because I suppose he did, was the founder. I'd seen him that first day here in this very room, but today he wore no mask, no sash. He had no need to hide who or what he was. He still wore that same suit though, coal black. His skin was only a few shades lighter, offsetting the gray and white streaks in his close cropped hair. I would have called it an executive look if we had been in a boardroom somewhere. His pupils burned with an inner light. His violet eyes flickered between Bob and I as he stalked across the room. That same predator's tread. That same oppressive weight on my chest. He stopped as he reached the center of the room, turning to regard us in turn. Todd was visibly trembling, as was the warden. Todd's was the tremor of a frightened prey animal, while the warden's was that of an eager hound dying to be let off the leash. Alma was attempting her signature look of implacable calm, though something about her eyes hinted at her youth and inexperience and fear. The architect was beaming for once, thrilled to be in the presence of the creature that held her chain. I locked my gaze with Bob across the circle and allowed myself a grim smile. It seemed as though he and I were the only ones unaffected by the arrival of this creature, this Duke of Hell. Sir. He swung around to regard me, eyes alight, and an easy grin slipped onto his face. The Admiral, a pleasure. Let me shake your hand, sir. His grip was like a vice, his skin hot to the touch. I was surprised to realize we were about even in height. He'd seemed taller somehow as he entered the room. It's nice to be able to put a face to the name. Ah, but that's not my name, is it? I don't personally feel the need for these titles. Or your mortal nicknames. He pulled me closer. The strength implied in that simple action enormous. As if he was being ever so careful not to hurt me. Like I might cradle a mouse. You can call me by my true name, Admiral. <laughs> you can call me Belial. The door to the barn swung open, 
and I stepped from the dim elegance of the manor into the bright, dusty daylight of Jack's farm. Somehow it looked even worse on second viewing. Row after row of parched, desiccated crops stretched to the tree line. The man's tractor had been parked in a drunken stupor on the far side of the field weeks ago. Instantly, sweat began to drip down my forehead and slide along the back of my neck. It was inhumanly hot under the relentless sun. There, already cawing in a fury as they covered that poor excuse of a scarecrow, was a whole flock of crows. I started for the house, the ground cracking under my tread. I hoped to catch him now, when the farm was in this state, before the arrival of his late wife made the conversation a good deal more complicated. Barely visible in the bright sunlight, Samuel kept pace at my side. I think this is working, Dad. I'm trying not to get my hopes up, but maybe. We've come so far already. Once we get past this trial, once we're in the inner circle, just think of everything we could do. Everything that might be possible. With your position and my arcane insights... I caught sight of him enough to see he was grinning ear from ear. We'll be unstoppable. This is why you go to war with your brothers. Who the hell would buy a fucking farm? Sounds like we'd better hurry. We hustled across the open ground to the front door of the farmhouse. And I rapped hard on the wooden frame. Who the fuck? What the fuck do you want? He was even uglier on the outside than he'd felt to be inside. His thin lips were twisted up in a scowl, wisps of hair hanging in oily curls around his balding head. Tobacco and booze warred in my nose as his foul breath washed across my face. I tried to push past all that and offer up a kindly smile. Jack, right? My name is David. Yeah, so? You don't know me, but I know you, Jack. I know you very well, in fact. You've been having trouble with your farm, and I'm here to help. You got a fucking pile of cash hiding in that piece of shit uniform you're wearing? No, nothing like that. I'm, uh... I leaned in closer, like I was sharing a secret. I know about Liz and the fire. His eyes bulged from his head like meatballs, bloodshot. His mouth hung open, a gaping void. What the fuck did you just say? I know about what happened with Liz, and the fire, and the school full of kids. It's a problem, sir. One you're going to have to face, sooner rather than later. As if on cue, the wind behind me picked up. I didn't have to look to know his wife was going to work, readying for her revenge. Mister, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about, but if you don't get the hell off my property, and I mean right goddamn now, I'm going to- I simply stepped to the side, gesturing out at the field. Before our very eyes, crops were sprouting from the ground and the soil was churning with mud. How... How are you doing this? Unfortunately, this isn't me. Think back, Jack. You know who this is. Huh? She never really left. Liz, this is her doing. No. No, no, she's dead. She's dead. But she's not gone. And she's not going to let you go. Across the field, I saw the fire begin to kindle around the scarecrow. It looked like Liz's spirit wasn't happy I was here talking to her husband. I can help you, if you'll let me. What in the name of horseshit? That's her. She's here. It can't be! Who, who, the, who the fuck are you? I'm a friend, if you'll let me. I know you. I know what you're capable of. I know that things didn't go the way you wanted them to. But if you let me, I can fix this. And then you and me are going to sit down and have a nice conversation about what you might accomplish in the future. She had already unhooked herself from the pole and was moving slowly across the field. 
Footprints filled with embers lit the crops on fire, despite the mud and unnatural wetness. No! No, it is her! How? Will you let me help you? Yes, goddammit, help me! Stop her! Don't let her take me! Fuck! And afterwards, we'll talk. Mr. Afterwards, I'll go to hell and back for you, but that's what it takes. Just don't let that bitch take me! I smiled. What an interesting turn of phrase. You've made a good choice, sir. I turned to face the damned spirit of Jack's dead wife. I would take no pleasure in this, but it had to be done. Cursed. Bad. Luck. Yes. It is. The Trial of Admiral Beckett, Part 1. Written by Michael Zenke, with performances by Eddie Cooper as Beckett, Michael Turrentine as Samuel, Mark Witten as cocky little shit behind the counter, <laughs> Graham Rowett as Bob, Margaret Ashley as the architect, Chantal Jean-Pierre as Alma, Jason Wilson as the warden, Alastair Mackey as Todd and Jack, and Joe Stofko as Belial. Musical composition for this episode by J.M. Scherf. Episode artwork, web development, and creative direction by Cassie Pertit. Social media and Patreon management is by Brooks Bigley. Videography is by Hale Scherf. Audio engineering and sound design is by me, Jason Wilson. Once again, listeners, we love having all of you and wish you the best of health in this trying time. And we truly do hope that you enjoyed part one of the finale the trial of Admiral Beckett. This is the first of two parts. We hope that you will be just as addicted to as we are. We also would like to take the time to thank our patrons once again, and to any of those who have taken the time to leave us a five-star rating and a review. Those reviews keep us at the top of the charts and makes it easier for twisted souls to find the show. Patrons like Aaron Anthony, Amy Nikolai, Arthur Unk, Diverelli, Ellie Dowell, Ellen Houghton, Emily Cohen, Jack Obot Snows, Ronan Kumori, Jason Porras, Jeremiah Overstreet, Jessica Finch, Karina Sonina, Kay Davis, Kelly Bear, Klaus H., Kyle Wilcox, Laura Lupinetti, Lynn Browning, Lizzie B., Mesa, Megan Pruitt, Michael Velez, Mike Devine, Mitch Gerritz, Michael Philip BG, Paige Pye, Patrick Stewart, Plen Plen Plon, All Night Long, Sean Gary, Shea Barbie, Sparky Anglin, Spirit Live, Stacy Thewis, Sybil McKinney, Talicia Gallman, The Original Nick Show, and Rona Platt. The Grey Rooms is also streaming for free on Spotify. Just get the Spotify app or open the browser and search The Grey Rooms. And we here at The Grey Rooms love our fans and we want to give back to you in the best way that we know how. And we have lots of fun things to show you and we hope that you love them just as much as we love them. You can find out more about us by joining us on social media. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Reddit, YouTube, and Facebook. And we took your advice and extended an olive branch to all of the tortured souls who have passed through the rooms. Our emotional support group is always looking to help you with all of your needs. And feel free to jump in there. You might need some after this finale. And let's not forget about our merch store. It's full of epic designs and logos for you to sport, showing the world you are a survivor of these very rooms. All of this can be found in the show notes and or on our website at thegrayrooms.com. We also have a Patreon channel. Patreon.com forward slash the gray rooms. If you would like to financially support the show, jump on over there, find the tier that works for you, and sign up today. Bonus episodes, early release of episodes, and much more awaits you inside. We appreciate your help. And let's not forget about our Discord channel. If you haven't joined our Discord channel yet, you're missing out. One of the best and most active communities in the horror audio drama genre, in my personal opinion, 
and just a great group of people all around. You can meet the cast, you can meet authors, you can meet actors, patrons, and just listeners of the gray room such as yourself. So what are you waiting for? Go over to our Discord channel, jump in there, and get chatting. We have a lot in store for you in Season 4. But once again, this was Part 1 of the two-part finale. We're finalizing Part 2 now, and we're getting that ready for you next week. We have a lot of work left to do, and we don't want to waste any time, because this is going to close out with a bang. And if you think that we're going to stop there, nope, we have to get right into preparations for Season 4. So get back to work I must. Thanks again, everybody, and we will see you next week.